but anyway, so I'm very interested in the work by uh, our two presenters here today that has looking at uh, the future for, for small economies. The future, of course, is very difficult to predict, but I think if we look at current trends, you can actually see uh, what are the things that have made things good now and what are likely to influence in the future, and it's a really useful exercise to do. Our two speakers are both very um, distinguished, and um, uh, Michael O'Sullivan, Dr. Michael O'Sullivan here, is uh, uh, Director and Chief Investment Officer of uh, the International Wealth Management part of Credit Suisse. Uh, he was an independent member of, of N, uh, the National Economic and Social Forum Council here uh, from 2011 to 2016. So he still has not connection, very good connections here in Ireland, even though uh, he's now living in, in Paris, he tell me, uh, yeah. which is a very romantic city too. And uh, he has taught in Princeton University and Oxford University. He was educated in University College Cork and in Oxford. So uh, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, his colleague, David Skellig, is here. Uh, he's, in the, he's a founding director of the Landfall Strategy Group, a Singapore-based economic and political advisory firm. He has recently served as advisor to the McKinsey Centre for Government and a senior advisor to the Secretary for Foreign Affairs and Trade in New Zealand, and a small economy, uh, and as fellow of Singapore's Civil Service College. Uh, Dr. Skellig has a Master in Public Policy and a PhD in Public Policy from Harvard University uh, and a Master in Commerce degree from the University of Auckland. So we have people with qualifications and interests and working experience right around the globe uh, who are going to talk to us now about global trends for small countries and I think that's very useful. So Th you're going to start. Th thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. So first of all, thank you to the, the Institute, to Dan and Jill uh, for, for setting up this, uh, this session. Uh, so what, what I'll do just to start is to give you a sense uh, as to how we've, we've sort of happened upon this topic uh, and the particular relevance that it has for, for Ireland uh, today. So, uh, you know, David and I have, have the same kind of uh, esoteric hobby. Uh, there are not many other people uh, in the world who study kind of the amalgam of, uh, of small states and, and, and where they're going. Um, we've just come this morning from a, uh, a joint conference uh, hosted by the Department of Finance, uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and Department of uh, Trade um, on, on this topic. Uh, and I think that's quite exciting and it's, it's promising uh, for Ireland. Um, I think it's exciting because uh, in a country in particular, a city that is saturated with uh, Brexit, uh, you know, I believe we're now at the um, the end of the beginning of Brexit, if I can put it like that. And you know, beyond that, we have there are so many other challenges for Ireland. Um, and having for so long looked at ourselves as a smaller neighbour of the UK, um, I think the outlook for this country and, and the way we we think about ourselves and the mindset um, needs to to change. Um, I also think that it, you know people talk almost exclusively of Brexit as a threat. And I, I perhaps with the, with the sort of condition by financial markets, think that uh, the trade dispute between the US and China um, and everything that's doing to globalization in terms of slowing trade, fracturing supply chains, uh, and breaking down relationships, that, that's actually much more important, um, and I think economically more consequential for Ireland and other small countries, because small countries are by their, na their, their nature, they're open, they're very geared to globalization. Um, so I think we have to uh, invest an awful lot more time uh, in where globalization is going and uh, what this means for, for Ireland as a small country. Um, and I think the method and the way we do this is really important. And, and, and we were, I think, particularly um, uh, pleased that the conference this morning took place across uh, a whole range of government departments. And there's you know, historically in Ireland, you tend to get a lot of siloing in government um, and that people were cross-referencing each other with the, the, the help and support of academics and policy people, uh, I think is actually quite, quite promising. Just very quickly, first of all, what do we, what do we consider to be small, uh, advanced economies? People often put to David and myself the question, well, you know, isn't Ireland just a little version of the UK or isn't Singapore just a wee version of China? And they're not. The, the analogy I would use is if you take a lightweight oarsman or oarswoman or lightweight boxer and compare them to a heavyweight, 
uh, invariably they are faster, they're fitter, and they're technically better. And I think small countries are like that as well. And we, we kind of um, independently come up with um, the ideas, uh, I, I developed something called country strength, what makes a country strong. You know, so some countries like the US want to be great. Uh, I think countries are better off being strong. David has the term and the, the analytical scorecard of country resilience. Uh, and for me, this defines small countries. So you know, if you take, say, Sweden, geographically, it's twice as big as Germany. Population is much smaller, uh, but the way it thinks and acts and its policy uh, is focused on resilience. And what I mean by that is uh, having strong institutions, uh, having a, a, a rule of quality, rule of law, and respecting that rule of law. Uh, and also to quote uh, Joe Lee in his history of Ireland in the 20th century, he said the success of small countries uh, lies in their uh, ability to think strategically. And, and the most successful small countries uh, have that as a, um, a marked uh, quality. So we, we, we've arrived at a kind of a group of maybe 13 small countries uh, globally who we, we would probably classify as being in sort of the, the top of the peloton or the, uh, the league table of small countries from whom big countries can learn and other small countries can learn as well. Um, and what we think is special now, having you know been, been digging into this in various ways in the last few years, is um, that the time of small countries has really come. So we, we have experience of um, you know interacting with governments in say uh, Norway, Switzerland, uh, Singapore, and uh, they're very diverse culturally and politically. They have many of the same success factors. Many of the kind of the, the secret sauce of their success tends to be the same. And increasingly, they have uh, the same problems. And what we're now noticing and we're, we're, we're participating in is that these small countries are beginning to talk to each other. Um, David founded a small uh, economies group uh, um, of about sorry, six or seven uh, economies, Ireland, New Zealand, a part of that, uh, about six years ago. Uh, we've been involved in, found, in, in, in founding a group at the OECD amongst the OECD ambassadors called the Network of Open Economies and Open Societies. So for us, it really is an idea whose time has come. Um, and I think the best representation of this is this group called the Hanseatic League 2.0, uh, which uh, I'm told um, you know, initially occurred as sort of Pascal Donoghue inviting a group of other finance ministers to dinner. Uh, and they discovered that they had common views, they had common ethics and common problems, and now it's now coalesced into something that's maybe not quite formal, but it's certainly much more uh, coherent. Um, so we, we think we're, we're now at a, a point of departure where the debate in small countries will become maybe more formal, uh, would be better supported by, um, by data, um, and that they would be, I hope, viewed as kind of a coherent uh, group in a, in a changing world. Uh, I'm going to pass over to David. Uh, who I think will take through many through many of the uh, the economic and other indicators that we we've developed. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, <coughs> today. I mean, as you can probably get a sense of from Mike's uh, opening comments, uh, our answer to the, uh, the the question in the title is uh, uh, no. Uh, we're actually quite. Uh, you can go now. That's all we can. <laughs> um, we're actually uh, upbeat uh, on small economies, notwithstanding the challenges. Uh, and the complexity which we will uh, which we'll talk about as we make it to the next slide. Okay. Um, so this is an op-ed um, in the Financial Times um, uh, at the end of last year in September, uh, basically making the argument that with the threats to globalisation and geopolitical instability, uh, essentially the golden age of uh, small economies was over. It's a nice picture of one office building uh, in Singapore. You know, it's over. Um, that, of course, I mean, it is op-ed dropped in slightly... Um, uh, caricatures of reality, but it's not a new set of concerns. This is a pair of columns by a friend of mine, Gideon Rackman, in the Financial Times. Uh, the first on the left-hand side was from a column he wrote in 2007, uh, pre-crisis, and the analogy there, as you can probably guess, is big lumbering birds with sort of small, agile birds kind of pecking the, the flesh off them. So it's kind of age of globalisation, small, nimble states have a competitive advantage. Uh, fast forward to 2009, title, How Small Nations Were Cut Adrift. You know, suddenly we have crisis, and we've got Ireland, and uh, various others in these kind of small dinghies on very turbulent um, uh, seas and the, the folk and the cruise liners seem uh, a good deal more uh, comfortable. So in a sense, you know, concern about, uh, you know, be it specific shocks uh, like the global financial crisis or 
uh, more structural uh, changes like the, the globalisation uh, threats that Janan was talking about are not uh, new, uh, but we think are significantly overstated. So I was sufficiently agitated uh, to write a response in the Straits Times, uh, basically saying, actually, I don't think that's right. You know, our view, and Mike articulated a little bit of this in his, his opening comments, you know, it's easy to point to risks, and we don't diminish the risks. Globalisation is challenged, uh, both for political and structural reasons. There is more geopolitical uncertainty. There are more risks. Uh, but we remain fundamentally upbeat, and the rest of this talk gives a sense of, uh, of why that is. Um, what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit through um, you know, how small economies have performed. It can be a sense of um, uh, you know, why it has been the golden age. Uh, then ask the question, you know, to what extent does it look like there's a regime change underway where the supporting positive environment for small countries is being eroded? Uh, and then lastly, uh, a section on why you shouldn't believe the hype uh, about the, the, the negative outlook uh, for small economies. So just by way of some summary statistics, and I'm very happy to email the presentation for those of you who are interested or it might be available um, uh, separately. This is just a chart of per capita income, uh, and obviously take the Irish number with a bit of a grain of salt. But yeah, at the top you've got the Switzerland's, the Norway's, the Ireland's, the Singapore's, uh, the average income is sort of circa 15 to 20 percent higher. So we've identified a group of 13 small economies, and I've got a group of 10 uh, larger economies for uh, sake of benchmarkings. Yes, there's a distribution, so unfortunately New Zealand is towards the bottom. Uh, but in general, small economies perform pretty well. Uh, the legend seems to have disappeared from that one. I'm not sure it's, well, maybe it's on a. Uh, well, I'll have to tell you what it says. Uh, essentially, small countries over the last 20 years, this is a GDP growth rate chart, small advanced economy group is in blue. They significantly overperformed. This goes back 20 years. You could go back to the start of the 90s and the same would be true. And even through a more challenging uh, post-crisis period with very stagnant world trade growth, uh, you know, fairly lacklustre growth globally, you know, the small countries have uh, tended to overperform uh, other industrialised groups, be it G7, uh, OECD countries. And if you look over the last couple of years, uh, small economies front ran the global recovery as world trade uh, picked up. So there's a consistent story of overperformance and a pretty good recovery uh, from the crisis. This goes beyond economics. Uh, there are many measures of kind of inclusive growth. How well are you doing on social, environmental, human development uh, numbers? You see a very, very similar uh, picture uh, of small countries performing well economically, uh, but also socially. This is just a summary uh, indicator uh, of social progress, where small countries, unsurprisingly led by the, the Nordics and the like, uh, dominate. Um, and if you look at other measures of you know, labour force participation, the ability to get people into the workforce productively, uh, small economies consistently have an edge. So the point is that small economies have performed well uh, on a range of dimensions uh, over time. But the question is, to what extent has that been driven by a particular set of external circumstances over the last 30 or 40 years? And obviously the one that's most commonly pointed to uh, is globalisation. So on this chart we have two series. Uh, the yellow line is exports of goods and services as a share of world GDP. And you can see, particularly from, um, and it's been increasing since the, the 1960s, uh, but from, let's say, the early 1990s, when the period of intense globalisation kicked in, there was an acceleration. Uh, and small economies, as I'll talk about in a moment, uh, actively participated in that process. But you can also see, even if you kind of screen out the, the dip uh, in and around the crisis, it's basically flatlined um, since McKinsey had a nice report out um, last week that documents the, the slowdown across a range of globalisation dimensions in a bit more detail. And alongside the, uh, the growth in exports, if you look at outward direct investment, or inward direct investment, because the two series should mirror each other, again, from the early 1990s, you see very rapid expansion of the global footprint of firms as they slice up global value chains uh, and expand. So it has been a period over the last 25, 30 years uh, of intense uh, globalisation. And if you look at the small country experience uh, over that period, you see meaningful uh, increases in the, the, the share of their economy uh, that's accounted for by the external sector. Uh, so I've got the overall small advanced economy group in blue. Uh, I've stripped out uh, countries like Singapore and Hong Kong uh, and Ireland that are something of, of outliers uh, against the grey line, which is the, the large country group. And you can see meaningful. So even if you just take the yellow line, uh, it's going from sort of circa 30% um, uh, to around 40% uh, over that period. Uh, obviously for the, the full group, it's an even more significant increase. Um, it's more uh, marked than the, the large country uh, group. And if you just look at uh, the levels uh, of exports, again, not surprisingly led by the Hong Kongs, the Singapore's, the islands. But if you look at the cross-section, it's pretty clear that uh, most small countries have sort of 50, 60 percent plus uh, exports of GDP. And now, in, in a sense, there's nothing particularly surprising there. You would imagine that small economies, almost by definition, will have larger uh, external uh, sectors. That's where productivity growth and innovation uh, comes from. 
Uh, but it's, uh, this notion of a supportive uh, global uh, economic environment has been obviously core to, um, to small country performance. Uh, and again, apologies for the, the loss of a legend. But this is just a chart that maps uh, small economy GDP growth rates against uh, world trade growth. Uh, and you can see a very tight uh, mapping uh, over the last um, 20, uh, 25 years. Uh, now, obviously, the, the concern at the moment um, is that we're seeing a slowdown in world trade growth, both for cyclical reasons, as the global economy comes off a boil, uh, but also potentially for structural reasons uh, as well. So the point I suppose to make is, yes, it is the case that globalisation has provided the following wins uh, for small economies. It has helped to support uh, their growth, and they've benefited um, uh, from that. Um, <laughs> again, so the chart that shows another dimension, which is uh, outward direct investment flows, uh, the blue line uh, is small economies, the grey line is small economies, ex Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, and again, the participation in globalisation is even uh, more evident uh, on that dimension. Um, but as we can uh, see, as I mentioned a moment ago, world trade growth seems to be coming off a boil uh, in a cyclical sense. Uh, and the concern is that's going to uh, intensify due to some of the issues that Mike was talking about uh, earlier. So the question, I suppose, is to what extent uh, has small economy uh, outperformance, economically, socially, and the like, uh, being driven by this kind of positive uh, international environment, geopolitical stability, globalisation, strong global growth. Uh, and the claim that we would make is you know, clearly it has helped, uh, but it's not the only thing. Um, you know, if you look at the IMF uh, forecasts uh, going forward, uh, they remain somewhat upbeat. Um, small economy growth outlook is in the blue, uh, large country in the yellow. So there's a, an expected uh, growth delta, uh, even in the context of an emerging uh, global environment. But more fundamentally, there are several factors that we think support uh, resilient small economy performance uh, that you see consistently across the higher performing uh, small countries. Uh, one is they have strong national balance sheets. Now, this is not universally true, uh, as, we, uh, as we have discovered, but in general, uh, there is a sense that, that small countries run a, a tight fiscal shop uh, because they are more volatile, and it is the case that small countries have more exposure to shocks. Uh, they, they understand the importance of um, building up uh, a buffer, having some options. Uh, so fiscal balance or small fiscal surplus is of a norm for, for small countries, and post-crisis, many of them actively moved uh, to consolidate their finances. Uh, and on the kind of the, the national side, uh, external balance is common. Now, for countries like Ireland and New Zealand, unfortunately, uh, current account deficits are, uh, have been the norm. But in general, um, there are strong uh, external balance positions. Coupled with that, you see very strong competitive positions. So if you look, for example, at the share of world trade that comes out of small countries, and if you look at that at a sectoral level, there's a consistent story over the last 20 years of small advanced economies doing better than larger advanced economies because they tend to be concentrated in sectors in which they have particular advantage. They invest heavily in R&D, so on and so on. They have strong multinationals, so I've got an index that looks at the performance of multinationals from small countries versus a broader pool, uh, and they tend to uh, outperform. So there's something about the competitive position and the specialisation that we see in small countries that gives them a degree of resilience, even in the context of if you like, flat, flatlining um, sort of GDP growth uh, and world trade growth. Thirdly, there is a very strong tendency across small countries to invest heavily. Uh, R&D is consistently high. There are some outliers in a positive sense, the Israels, um, uh, countries like Switzerland uh, and the like, but also in a more broad-based way, uh, very serious around human capital investment. I mentioned earlier the strong performance of small countries in terms of labour market participation, so they're able to educate people, get them productively uh, into employment. Um, and private sector business investment or private sector investment ex-residential um, is consistently higher as well. So there's a notion of investing in the future, uh, which is core to uh, strong productivity performance. They deeply understand the importance of, of integration, uh, be it regional integration, be it WTO, be it free trade agreements, which is something that our larger neighbours in this region could learn something about. Sitting in Singapore, we look at Brexit with just complete bewilderment because <laughs> it's the, the anti-Singapore. Uh, small countries don't make strategic mistakes like that because they understand uh, the stakes. Uh, and then lastly, but by no means leastly, strong political institutions, which is a topic that we spent quite a bit of time talking about this morning. You know, quality of governance, quality of decision making, the ability to think strategically, as Mike mentioned, uh, is core. And if you look at the international rankings from the World Bank and others on measures of effective governance, social capital, trust, uh, and the like, uh, small countries get the basics right. And if I look at the response to the crisis, the global financial crisis across small countries, there was a consistency and a discipline in the approach that was uh, often not the case in, uh, in larger countries. And now many of, us, of these dimensions, uh, be it external integration, 
the importance of R&D and the like, uh, there is a deep social or political consensus around the importance uh, of this based on uh, confidence in political institutions. And I would also argue if you take a, a forward-looking view, and this is an area that I've done quite a bit of work on with my, my small country government uh, clients, you know, yes, there are a whole raft of challenges and opportunities in a structural sense that are going to deeply affect national economic performance uh, over the next 10, 20 years uh, and beyond. And just to give you a few examples from this non-exhaustive list, you know, one is the impact of disruptive technology, which we're beginning to see, but will pick up pace. It's everything from automation to AI to 3D printing uh, and the like. You know, the, the claim that I would make is actually uh, small countries are quite well placed to capture value and to manage the risks uh, from these. Many of them, not all, but many of them have uh, very high levels of human capital. They've got issues around shrinking working age populations. Uh, they've got uh, still fairly large manufacturing shares. One of the little known facts is that small countries have higher manufacturing shares than uh, large country counterparts. And to many of these countries, uh, these technologies, although clearly disruptive, you know, hold, they solve a big problem. You know, how do you remain competitive with high cost structures and, uh, and the like? So this is why countries like Singapore and Denmark uh, and others are very actively engaged in initiatives around the fourth industrial revolution. So to me, disruptive technology and managing the, the social and political consequences of that is something where small countries are particularly uh, well placed. Second point, yes, it's the case that uh, slowing world trade growth is a problem. I showed you the chart of uh, the tight mapping between world trade growth and small country GDP growth uh, earlier. So anything that diminishes world trade growth is you know, clearly going to be uh, a negative. But neither would I uh, over-egg uh, how much of a, an issue the US-China uh, conflict is. For, for one uh, thing, many of these small countries are deeply embedded into regional uh, architecture and have a big portfolio of FTAs. Uh, which doesn't completely immunise you, but provides a degree of, uh, a degree of resilience. Uh, many of them are very FDI intensive, uh, very high outward FDI shares, uh, so they're not as exposed to tariffs. And if you look at the nature of their exports, uh, relative to large countries, there's a much larger services share, uh, which again, given that many of the tariffs and the like are deployed against uh, manufacturers uh, and other exports of goods, again, uh, provides a degree of comfort. So again, I'm not wanting to dismiss this. Clearly, it's a, it's a negative and a complicates thing, uh, but I would say that small countries uh, have been aware of this. They've been aware of things like this actually for the last 15, 20 years, which is why they were front-running the free trade agreement um, uh, sort of push from 20 years ago. Uh, and I would argue uh, uh, not perhaps as exposed as, as you might um, believe from simply looking at the export uh, shares that I showed uh, earlier. Uh, on other things like climate change, um, small economies are, are pretty well placed in terms of emission intensities. And, and I think, you know, again... Uh, you know, central to a lot of us is the, the last point on, on the slide, which is small countries well understand the importance of uh, inclusive growth, of making sure that the gains from growth are well shared. So if you look at the difference between uh, pre-tax income distribution uh, and post-tax, uh, pre-tax is not really very much in it. Uh, small countries are as unequal as large countries. They're exposed to international markets, which puts pressure on the, the income distribution. But they very deliberately put in place tax and transfer systems to... Uh, to soften that. And so, you know, once those are taken into account, there's a much smaller um, uh, sort of, um, uh, or much tighter distribution uh, of income. Employment rates are higher. And so I guess the point that I would make is that the, the, the pushback against uh, openness, against globalisation, uh, the breakdown in trust institutions is much less observed in small countries than in large, simply because small countries are aware of the need to maintain social consensus. Uh, as one example, uh, government spending shares of GDP in small countries, with a couple of exceptions like Singapore, uh, are much higher than is the case in large countries. Um, so it's this paradox between being small and open and having to be competitive, but also bearing in mind you've got to have policies to offset uh, some of the downsides of that. So as a consequence, I actually think, you know, as we look forward, you know, although it is a more uh, challenging picture on many dimensions, uh, I would argue that small countries are pretty well placed on a range of dimensions uh, to, uh, to respond um, uh, to that. Um, and the final uh, slide that I'll talk to before I, I hand to Mike for some, um, for some closing thoughts, uh, the final thing that gives me confidence is if you take the long view, and this, this is uh, a complicated slide but I'll explain, this goes back 200 years. So Angus Madison, economic historian, uh, had data sets for capital income going back to 1820. So all I do here is I look at how close various economies are to the per capita income frontier uh, over various periods of time. Um, and although the, the font might be a little bit small, uh, if you look at the, uh, the blue line, uh, for example, which is the uh, average proximity to the income frontier uh, since 1900, so the last 100 plus uh, years, it actually turns out that many small countries have been at or about the income frontier 
uh, more so uh, than large economies. So if you look at the Switzerland's, the Denmark's, the Netherlands uh, and, and the like, these countries have maintained positions close to the frontier on average despite wars and depressions and periods of slow growth. So uh, again, I'm not wanting to make light of the challenges, but it is to say that there is something about uh, small economies uh, where there is a degree of resilience. They have political uh, institutions, they have uh, economic capacity, um, social capacity that enables them uh, to respond. You know, that said, there are clearly examples not on this chart, and I'm thinking here of countries like Greece and the like, small countries that don't have those things, where you know, we've seen them flail around and do quite badly. So simply being small doesn't guarantee success. But I would also argue, as I said right at the start, that it's easy to exaggerate the uh, exposure and vulnerability uh, of small economies uh, to a changing world. And in my view, is uh, actually there's an underlying resilience to small economies that for those economies that are serious, that sink strategically, uh, we'll see them um, uh, maintain their overperformance over uh, over coming decades. So, Mike, I might just hand to you for some, some closing thoughts. <laughs> that, that was that, I think. Yeah, was <laughs> Thanks. So let, let me just tee up some, uh, some questions for, uh, for debate. And uh, I mean, what, what, we, what we try and do whenever we uh, meet an audience is try and reduce this to uh, tangible or practical uh, recommendations. So, so the, I think the first one for small countries um, in, in terms of what they do is a change in mindset, a uh, change in policy and mindset. And we, we mean that in uh, two sense. Uh, one is the reference group. So you know, maybe 30 years ago, the Department of Finance, if they were considering a new uh, law, a new policy, the first place they would look for look to uh, in terms of a template would have been the UK, maybe even the US. Uh, but certainly not Sweden or Singapore uh, or Switzerland. Um, and we think that that will increasingly uh, change. Uh, there was a, deb a debate this morning on the spatial geography of Ireland, the fact that Dublin is uh, so big in terms of population, share of business, etc. cetera. Um, and there, there is a, a debate going on uh, as to how to uh, grow the, the other cities in the country from Waterford, Cork, Limerick, etc. cetera. Uh, one very good example of that is Switzerland which has got maybe four or five cities uh, where there's a real sense of balance uh, and role across the country. Um, the other way, I think, in, in terms of changing mindset is, uh, you know, what is the, the goal? Um, and there is a debate internationally on GDP and whether that's a relevant uh, metric. Um, most politicians and political policymakers tend not to look beyond the notion of making their country great uh, that's often at the expense of others, uh, or simply uh, thinking in terms of GDP. Um, and, and what we have, I, I think, collectively uh, uh, found or, or reduced is that this idea of resilience or country strength can, can actually be translated and expressed as a, a scorecard. Things like the rule of law, uh, institutions, minimizing uh, economic volatility. And, and if you want to see how these things work, uh, again, David mentioned, look at the countries where they don't work. Look at Hungary, look at Greece, uh, look at Portugal, and look at the difference uh, between the recent economic p performance of those countries and the countries that we would consider to be resilient. Our Ireland, I think, is, a, is um, an, an increasingly good example uh, of that. So that, that, I think, is sort of the, the policy uh, method. Then the, the threats are, are maybe two or threefold. So one of the, the projects we're, we're trying to, to get off the ground is a, a small country uh, investment fund or, or uh, exchange traded fund and, and in order to do that we've constructed lots of indices of how uh, equity and bond markets of small countries compared to those in bigger countries uh, and actually over time you find there's actually quite good outperformance of small countries if you look at um, the export oriented uh, firms in small countries they tend to do very well but just by looking at these kind of trends you can see that the market is increasingly uh, penalizing in some, in some countries uh, companies that are uh, global uh, in their orientation. So this week we had uh, you know, profit warnings from uh, semiconductor companies uh, in the States, Caterpillar, Apple has been, been shaky of late. Uh, and these are all companies that are hitched to globalization. They, they tell a story and they give us a warning that as globalization is changing and slowing, uh, companies need to adjust to this, but also co uh, countries who are geared to globalization also need to change. Uh, and then the second and final aspect of this is that as globalization is receding, and if you look at all the measures of globalization, trade, uh, 
the flow of people, the flow of ideas, the flow of finance, uh, they are all uh, receding. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's not yet unambiguous that globalization is dead, but it's certainly giving over to something new. And I think that new thing is a multipolar world made up of three big regions, Europe, uh, China, Central Asia, and uh, the US. And as that world order forms, lots of things will change. So countries who are in between these regions, from Japan to the UK, you know, might fall between the cracks. Um, institutions we hold dear, the UN, the World Trade Organization, uh, the World Bank, and who have been pillars of the 20th century, century order, uh, will in some cases fade uh, and crumble. Um, and we think one of the viable, um, I think, alternatives to this is uh, new coalitions of uh, countries, of which uh, small countries can be one. Um, what we've seen so far is that where you have groups of small countries, be it the Hanseatic League uh, 2.0, there's a very strong sense that an informal association of these countries works very, very well because it allows people to discuss and to exchange ideas without maybe the formal... Uh, pressure of actually having to publicly express their views or take uh, uh, position stances. So, um, you know, we, I think to sum up what we're saying, we think the, the world is changing. Small countries uh, can be exposed to this, but I think there's also a method and a process that would allow them to uh, maybe to marshal this change and adapt uh, to it. So perhaps Dan, if we and, and if we if we maybe uh, one, you can of one, course one final, uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll sit down and try and understand no. what my chair. <laughs> <laughs> one final point. We, we've kind of Mike and I we've made a, a case that small countries are uh, a world position, and it's not the case that the world belongs to the large. And one of the things that we've been writing about over the last uh, <coughs> uh, few years is this notion that actually large countries are becoming uh, uh, more exposed to these global trends. There, you know, if you look at the debates in the US, the UK, uh, elsewhere, they're grappling with issues that small countries have been grappling with for some time. How do you manage uh, openness? How do you manage technology uh, and the like? Uh, and so our view is, you know, when organisations like the G20 uh, and the like get together, there should be a more active small country voice because in many cases, small countries have been thinking hard about these issues uh, for, for some time. So, uh, but, uh, okay. <laughs>